Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Welcome to Vineyard Community Church. My name is Pastor Parker. I'm the youth pastor. And also a special welcome to everybody watching or listening online. I'm so excited to be speaking about part two of our series, Giants of Faith. Giants of Faith. And, and we take this out of the book of Hebrews. And so the, the author in the book of Hebrews, he wrote this, this one chapter just kind of detailing these giants of faith. And he lists out these people who did amazing things for the Christian faith. And he gives like a short summary of, of what they did. And then we find ourselves in, in our, our verse for the series in Hebrews 12, verse 1. And that says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And the author of Hebrews, he kind of makes it seem like, like all of those giants of faith are kind of in the stands. There are a cloud of witnesses for this life that we're living, for this race that we're running. And he says it's almost like they're cheering us on, they're encouraging us, they're, they're pushing us along the way. And he says, so since we're surrounded by all of these people, I mean, let's do the best that we can. And so we thought it would be cool if throughout this series we would pull one out of the stands and kind of look at their lives individually and say, what can we learn from their race? Because they finished it. They're done. You know, they're not here anymore, but they did it successfully and we're still going forward, right? So last week, Pastor Andy opened up talking about the prophet Isaiah. Now this week we are talking about a woman named Rahab. Now what's interesting about Rahab's story is she was a prostitute. Yes, I just said that on stage. It's okay. <laughs> But what's cool, spoiler alert, if you don't like spoilers, maybe plug your ears right now. You know, I don't know about you, but I hate them. But spoiler alert, she actually ends up becoming one of the great, 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 whatever, grandmothers of Jesus. Yes, the same Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. She's actually in the genealogy of Jesus. Her blood literally running through the veins of the Messiah. So how did we get to that point? How did we start there? I believe if we talked to Rahab, she'd say, you know what, my life didn't start out that way. My life was actually horrible at first. It was even disappointing. And some of may, maybe you feel the same way. Maybe you've thought, dang, my life is not going the way I want it to right now. My story is not very exciting. It's, it's not something you'd, you know, you'd want to be encouraged by. I'm not, I'm not loving my story right now. And I think if Rahab were to, to tell us anything, you know, she would say that my story didn't stop there. And my story didn't stop there. Matter of fact, if you look in Psalm 139, it says that before a day has even occurred, that God has written out our steps. He's written out our steps. But then that begs the question, okay, God, if that's true, did you really write this life out for me? <laughs> did you really write this circumstance out for me? Did you really put this problem in my life, this financial struggle, this marital issue, this, this school problem, God? Did you really give this to me? And the answer is no. God writes this amazing story for us, but how many of you know we like to throw in a couple extra chapters on our own, right? <laughs> we like to put in a couple extra subplots and, and character development to make things a little bit interesting, you know? See, Rahab would have looked at us and said, yes, my story started off rough, but through my life, through my mess, through my circumstances, I learned one thing. And that one thing is, is my tweetable thought for you this morning. Basically, that means you can post it on Facebook. You can tweet it, Instagram, Snapchat, your ChristianMingle.com. I don't judge. Uh, and that, that thought is, 
Let God write your story. Let God write your story. Let him do it. Give him the pen. This very next verse in Hebrews uh, 12, verse 2, it actually says that God is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the author. See, there's a few things we learned from Rahab's story. And the first being that in the middle of her mess, she found that God searches for us to be in his story. God searches for us. He looks for us. He goes out of his way to search for you to be in his story. You've got to know that. The rewrite of our lives starts with God searching for us first. He initiates the process. He goes out of his way to find us. It's nothing that we do, but he starts it. I like to think that I've been very blessed with an awesome uh, family. Two wonderful parents, two amazing younger brothers. And I like to think that we're just dysfunctional enough to keep things interesting, you know. Like maybe one day we could possibly have a reality show, like keeping up with the Matthiases or something, you know. Like it's not too bad, but, but it's just, it's a fun time. And we weren't what you would call the most active churchgoers growing up, but I knew we were important. I knew people thought we were important because when we walk in the building, I once overheard someone calling us CEOs. And I was like, dang, that's so nice of them. They, they're giving us this position of authority. They don't even know us. But <laughs> then I learned that CEO actually stood for Christmas and Easter only. <laughs> but that was us, man. That's who we were. You know, growing up, I was kind of the stereotypical oldest sibling. You know how they have the youngest, the middle child, and the oldest child. I was pretty responsible. I was pretty organized, largely independent. I hated asking people for help. And, you know, it's just kind of how I lived my life. But because of this nature, I, I kind of developed this this label throughout elementary school and middle school and high school, and that was like the goody two-shoes, you know, the rule follower, and my least favorite of all, perfect Parker. <laughs> now, labels can be a good thing sometimes. They can help us define aspects of our lives. They can bring definition to an otherwise ambiguous world. They let us know where we stand, right? But on the other end, they can be pretty restrictive, they can put a box around we think our potential is or where our life is going to go. They, they limit us. At a very young age, I found myself doing whatever it took to break this label. I felt in a way responsible to uphold it, but on the other end, desperate for relief from it. One time in high school, uh, the annual Powder Puff football game was coming up at Princess Anne Cap. With, shout out to PA, come on. Um, and if you don't know what powder puff is, it's where the, the girls play football and the guys, we cheer them on. Now, what was exciting about this is it was the junior class versus the senior class. So we took it very seriously, okay? And so uh, my friends, uh, by the way, I don't think my parents are aware of this story. So hi, mom and dad. Um, my friend approached me with this idea. She wanted to, to pull a prank before the game. And, you know, in this season of my life, I was down. I was ready for it. I was excited. She wanted to spray paint class of 2011 all over the football field and stadium. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Let's go for it. And I like to think that I've watched enough Law and & Order and Criminal Minds to know how this should go down, okay? <laughs> so I told her, I said, hey, we got to buy the supplies from Walmart in advance, about a week in advance. we got to pay in cash so there's no paper trail, okay? <laughs> And then we're going to wear all black so there's no distinguishing marks about us. And then we got to park across the street in town center and walk over because there's cameras. And people always get caught with cameras. And so we got there. It's the night of. It's Thursday night at about 10 p.m. No one's at the school. We walk over. We, we see that the fence to the football field is locked. That's okay. We got legs. We jump over it. Okay. We get to the football field. And I said I was rebellious, but not too rebellious. Okay. Like I'm not trying to go to jail. Like some people like to live life on the edge, but I'm not trying to jump over the edge, you know, probably give me an asthma attack or something. So, so, so we get there and I was like, Hey, why don't we just spray paint the field itself? Like grass grows back, you know, they can cut it. If we get caught, They'll just be like, oh, these kids, you know. And so we do that. We spend a couple hours spray painting the biggest class of 2011 on the field that you have ever seen. I mean, you could probably see it from a plane flying over the field. And so after these hours had passed, you know, we, we gathered our materials. We jumped back over the fence. We got to our cars and we went home. And I was laying in bed so excited for the next day, you know. I couldn't wait to hear people talking about it, to see people's reactions at the game. And so I, I took a shower. I'm getting dressed. I grab my keys and I go to walk outside. And you will not believe what I saw. You will not believe the police. 
I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, that didn't happen. Um, it was raining. And not just any type of rain. I mean like a torrential downpouring. I was heated. So I got into my car, windshield wipers on full blast, get to school. I'm sitting in my first class texting my friend like, can you believe this? And then on the, no the morning announcements, not even the afternoon announcements, they postponed the powder puff game. No one got to see what we did. <laughs> All of that work, all of that planning, all of that effort was for nothing. I still don't think people today know what we did. Not a single gym class went outside that day. The game was pushed back another week, so I'm sure they cut the grass before then. Like, it was not good. <laughs> but this, this thing, though, the, the, this season of life was a represent, representation of what I was trying to do. You know, on the outside, life was great, but on the inside, I was exhausted I was so desperate to throw off this label. I did everything I could to succeed in public, but sin in private. Acting is exhausting. Acting is so exhausting. I'm talking secret parties, you know, secret failing grades, secret unhealthy relationships, the type of relationships you know are bad for you, but you stay in anyway because you're lonely. That was my life. Now, what's crazy about this story, though, is that God didn't let me stay there. God didn't keep me there. He actually had placed people around me who had been inviting me to church for two years. And after coming out of a particularly bad relationship, I was finally listening. And so I accepted that invite. I came to church, this very church, and I sat through a service. And that night I accepted Jesus. I trusted God. And my life would never be the same. The pastor gave an altar call. I made that decision and life moved forward. And you know, I thought I knew what I wanted for my life at that point. I had a good plan. I was gonna go away for school, get out of Virginia Beach. I was gonna get, get a degree so I could make as much money as I possibly could. I wanted to live this comfortable life. And God said, I've got other plans for you. And he put this desire in my heart to pursue ministry, a desire I could not shake. And believe me, I tried. <laughs> I tried to resist. I said, Lord, no, this is not for me. But yet he brought me here. What's important to know is that right in the middle of your darkness, God searches for you. God looks for you. He goes after you. And so we're finding ourselves back where Rahab is. And at this point of our story, Moses has died. The guy that freed the, uh, the Israelites from the Egyptian slavery. He brought them through the Red Sea up into the promised land, but he is dead. And so Joshua took charge of the Israelites and he's leading them battle after battle, victory after victory, trying to claim the land that God promised them. And they're approaching the next city. And now that city is Jericho. Now Jericho is known to have this huge wall surrounding it. Okay, now this wall was so amazing that it was, it was said to be impenetrable. And so before Joshua went to battle, he was going to send two spies to go survey the land. So they knew what was going to happen before they got there. And this is where we find ourselves in Joshua 2, verse 1. It says, then Joshua, son of Nun, so he had no parents, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he secretly sent two spies from the city. He said, go look over the land. He said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. See, the craziest part about the story isn't that they were going to war, but out of all the houses they choose to stay at, it's the house of a prostitute. It's the house of a woman with this type of lifestyle. I don't know if she can necessarily be the most trustworthy person, Joshua. Are you sure if this is the house that you want us to stay at? <laughs> now, this wasn't a random occurrence. This was actually a strategic thing. Now, Rahab's house would have been almost like a nook, almost like a hideaway inside of the wall itself. I've got a picture for you. So this is obviously an artistic illustration of what that could be. But her house would have been a part of the wall. And so them going to that specific house was an easy access for them to get in the city and get out of the city in case anything were happening. But why even bring that up? Why even in show that, that God decided to choose this woman in her mess and in, in her struggles? Because in the midst of your story, church, God is searching for you. God is looking for you. He goes after you. As a matter of fact, he risked everything to find you. That moment you place the pen in God's hand, I promise you, he begins to rewrite your story. He begins to restore your path. He takes 
everything that the world and life circumstances got wrong and he makes it right. The book of Revelation says it like this, that God will stand at the door and knock. He's God, he could bust the the door down if he wanted to, but that's not how he works. He invites you, he sends invitations, he sends people your way to help support you. John recorded Jesus saying this, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, so that you might go and contribute something to this world, so that you might go and, and give something to the people around you. Go and bear fruit. God always makes a way for us to be in his story. He always makes a way for us to be included, for be a part. You may be thinking, well, you know, it's not enough for God to just search for Rahab. It's not good enough for God to just search for me. I mean, it's nice that you do that, Lord. I appreciate that, but that doesn't fix my problem. That doesn't fix my mess. That doesn't fix her profession, God. So searching for me doesn't quite cut it. It's a good thing he didn't stop there. The two men, they come back to Rahab's house after surveying the land and they let her know what's about to happen. They let her know that the Israelites are going to come and that the the walls are going to come tumbling down and they're going to seize the city. And so naturally, Rahab looks at them and says, but I don't want to die. And they said, "Okay, well, all you have to do is swear this oath to us, swear this oath to us and God. And we promise you that you will live. And so this is what that oath was. It says, now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from this oath from you. If you let people know what's going on, we're going to release it. Don't let people know what's going to happen. Don't let them know what we're about to do. If you want to be saved, here's what you got to do. Tie this scarlet cord. Hang it out your window. Now, what's crazy about this is the the scarlet cord is actually throughout the Bible representation of the blood of Jesus. And so the very window that made a way for these two spies to get out of uh, the city is the very window that's going to save Rahab. And the very scarlet cord that she's going to tie represents the very blood of Jesus that saved us today. Dang, that's crazy. Mm. You see, Jesus makes a way for us. Amen. Amen. You can think of a path, you can think of another direction, you can think of your own way in life, but the truth is, is there's only one way out of darkness, and that's through the light of God. This promise goes on, and she says, agreed, let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in her window. She did what they said. And so some of you may know the rest of this story. The Israelites, in fact, they do come. And they do worship and they do praise God and they do fight the battle at Jericho and the walls do come tumbling down. There's just rubble left except for one sliver of the wall, a little place where Rahab's house was. She was saved. Her entire family was saved. She applied the promise of God and her way out came through. Her path to righteousness came through. She was saved. See, there are many paths you can take, but there's only one way out, and that's Jesus. It's easy to think, you know, maybe, maybe I'll try to do something else. Maybe I'll get another degree, and then my problem will be solved. You know, if only I had another job, then yes, definitely my problem will be solved. Or maybe if I get another spouse, my problem will be solved. Or just one more child, and everything will be good in our household. But the truth is, is that we know those things don't satisfy us eternally. We know those things don't last forever. The only eternal solution is your Father in heaven. When we allow Jesus to change our lives, he has this unique ability to take all of the darkness and to bring it to light. All of the chaos and make it peace. All of the mess that we experience and turn it into a message. The Apostle Paul knew this well. In a letter he wrote to the church in Rome, he said this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And we know it. We can stand firm on it. We can be secure in the fact that God is going to take our story and make it something good and turn it into something great and turn out this wrong life and make it something awesome. Not only was Rahab and her family completely saved, but when she thought, oh, God saved me, God said, but no, there's more to the story. It's not over yet. I've got a little bit more for you because God's story always has a redemptive ending. God's story always has a redemptive ending. Redemptive meaning better than you could have ever thought. 
Redemptive meaning where one thing has a solution, God is going to bring a part two. See, Rahab becomes the great, 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 whatever grandmother of Jesus. Matter of fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, so Matthew is one of the disciples of Jesus, and he, he felt the need to record everything he learned and, and saw and heard from Jesus. And his, in his account, he actually details the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to Jesus. And in that genealogy, he names 42 men. 42. 42 fathers, 42 grandfathers, 42 men. Do you know how many women he named? Four. Four women. But then that asks, we got to ask the question, why would he even do that in the first place? In a male-driven society, in a society where, where men were valued over women, why would he feel the need to include these four names in that genealogy? Well, I've got two opinions. On one end, I think he was unknowingly giving us evidence to show that God uses and transforms women just as much as men. Amen. And on the other end, Matthew had a pretty rough story himself. Matthew was a tax collector, and we all love the IRS, right? <laughs> but except at this time, Matthew kind of had freedom to take however much money he wanted to. Oh, yeah, the government says you, you owe this much money, but I'm going to add a, a couple extra bucks on it because uh, daddy needs a new car. And so he did that. He stole money. He took money from people, and that was his life. And when he read the stories of these four women, what struck him was how God redeemed their circumstances. And he said, Jesus redeemed mine. God redeemed theirs. I want people to know that he'll do the same thing for them. And so this is what happens to that genealogy. He says, so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, whose mother was Tamar. Now, Tamar, her story takes place in Genesis 38. If you want to learn about it, write it down. I don't have a whole lot of time to go in it, but it's dark, it's crazy, and it's about a woman who thought she would never get a blessing, but God comes through anyway. So-and-so, the father of so-and-so, whose mother was Rahab. Now, we know her story. And then it goes on to say, so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth wasn't even Jewish, <laughs> She was not even an Israelite, but yet God gave her her own book in the Old Testament and then uses her to be a part of the genealogy of Jesus. What? David was the father of so-and-so whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, Uriah's wife was the famous Bathsheba. Now, if you don't know the story of Bathsheba, uh, you know King David. Now, King David was uh, the king of, of, of Israel, very famous, did amazing things but the Bible says in a season where kings are normally at war, David was at home. And when he's at home, he goes on top of his house and he looks out and he sees a woman bathing naked as we do. <laughs> and he sees her and he says, oh, servant, go, go, go get her. Go bring her to me. Tell me about this woman. And he learns that she has a husband, but that doesn't stop him. And so he brings her into his house. He has relationship with her and uh-oh, she's pregnant. And so David's got to hide this. He's got to figure out what's going on. And so he ends up putting her husband, who's serving in a battle that David is not, on the front lines. And he dies. Now Bathsheba is caught in this circumstance where the king has manipulated her and, 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 and now given her a child. But God still redeems her story too. But why in the world would Matthew include these women? What would, he, what would he be trying to tell us? What is he trying to communicate to us? Here's what I think he's trying to say. Here's what I think Matthew wants us to know with these four women. He included Tamar because with Tamar, he wants you to know that God will forgive the darkest sin. You know, and with Rahab, he wants you to know that God will use you regardless of your past, right? And then with Ruth, he wants you to know that God will use any, anyone. He will not leave a single person out. And when it comes to Bathsheba, he wants you to know that God can heal any situation, he will not leave you out. He will not leave you in the dark. He will turn your story around. So the next time you feel like your darkness is too much for God's light, remember these four grandmothers. Remember these four women. Remember their stories and how God moved them in them then and how he wants to move in you today. If we were able to speak to Rahab, I believe that she would give us four statements. Four statements of encouragement. Four things that she would want us to learn about her life and use in ours. And they're on your outline. And the first one is this. God invites you to be a part of his story, so join him. Join him. If you're a note taker, write down, say yes. Join him. <laughs> Stop pushing the things of God to the side. Stop resisting what God is doing for you. Stop saying he's not speaking to me. He's speaking to, he must be speaking to someone else. I'm just getting the frequency. No, God is asking you to join 
him and you know who you are. You can feel it in your chest right now. You're thinking about it in your heart. You're like, dang, is he, is he talking to me? Yes. I tell you, when I was 16 years old and I gave my life to God, I remember the pastor preaching a message. And I remember sitting there, and if you've been to a couple churches before, you probably heard this token phrase or maybe even here. It came to the point where he said, all right, every head bowed, every eye closed. <laughs> and you, I, yes, my head was tilted down, but you better believe my eyes were 100% open. I don't know. You don't know what's about to happen. And so he's praying, and I'm keeping my eyes open. I'm looking around to make sure nobody's going to come up on me or something, you know. And he gives this, you know, encouraging story of how Jesus died for me. And he, he encouraged all of us, you know, every head bowed on the eyes, every eye closed on the counter through to raise their hands. And I didn't raise my hand because I was like, I don't know what's about to happen. A spotlight's going to come on me. He's going to call me up front. I'm not about that life. I can't do that. But I remember going home, having made that decision in my heart and wanting more. Wanting more, wanting to be involved in whatever was going on, whatever I'd experienced in that service. And so I came back the following week and I had the courage to raise my hand. I had the courage to publicly declare what I wanted to do with my life. You see, I'd been in church before, but I assumed that that made me a Christian. The truth is, is that God calls us to be in community. It's so true. But it's not being in the church that saves us, guys. It's being in Jesus that brings us salvation. So I went home that night a different person. I'd experienced a joy I'd never had before. I'd experienced uh, encouragement and, and grace and forgiveness and a purpose that I'd never quite felt before in my life. See, God promises that when we give our story to him, that he's going to give us so much more in return. That he's going to take everything that we have and he's going to tenfold it. John remembers Jesus saying this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you follow me, you will not be in darkness. In the mountaintops, in the valley seasons, you will have light in your life. And Luke records Jesus saying this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. We've got to get up, give up control. We've got to deny ourselves. We've got to understand that, yes, we have desires. And who knows, if we got everything we wanted, life would not be good. Amen. And so we've got to trust that God has something better for us, that God has something greater for us. The second thing that I think Rahab would want us to know is God wants to surprise you with his love. Accept him. God wants to surprise you with his love. Accept him. Because the truth is, is that when you give your life to God, he can do way more with it than you can. Of all the people in Jericho, God picks a prostitute to be in his story. God picks this woman. I mean, even going back further, you know, even going back, God decided to use Moses, a man who had horrible stage fright. He said, I cannot speak in front of people, God, let alone the fact that I killed somebody. And even more, two-thirds of the New Testament included in our Bible was written by a guy who hunted down, tried, and killed Christians. But we call him the Apostle Paul. But why? Why? Because God wants you to know that there's no place that you can go to get away from his love. That there's no life too far gone that he can't redeem. There's no circumstance too strong for the grace and the forgiveness of God. If God can turn around the worst sinners, what more could he do with us? The author of Hebrews writes this, we don't have a priest, referring to Jesus. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Take the mercy, accept the help, receive what I have. Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to work for it. Just receive what I have for you because it's free. The third thing that she would tell us is this. God wants you to love others with your actions. Serve him. God wants you to love others with your actions, so serve him. I don't think Rahab would have said that the best moment of her life was when she heard those walls tumbling down and, tum tumbling down and her house was still there. No, no. She would have said the greatest moment of her life was when she became the grandmother of the Messiah. The person that they've been hoping for, praying for, waiting for for years. She was in the line of the Son of God. She gave her life to God. See, God's going to rewrite your story. 
but he doesn't stop there. He's actually gonna use your story to impact lives of those struggling with similar things as you. Can we be myth busters real quick right now? Can we bust a myth that runs rampant in the church? That myth is you can't do anything for God until you've gotten your act together. Mm, just hit some people right there. You can't do anything for God unless you've gotten your act together. If that were the case, I promise you, I would not be standing on this stage right now. I promise you, you'd be coming into an empty church every single week. Put it this way, we're all in the same hospital. Some of us just got here before you did. God wants to use the darkness in your past. He wants to use the darkness in your past and present help to those in your present. Or better yet, that thing that you're still struggling with, God is going to redeem that circumstance so that in your future you can reach people just like you. God uses darkness to bring light to others. The disciple John wrote this letter and he said this, this is how we know what love is. Not by reading a self-help book, not by watching a reality show or, or, or following the royal wedding, though it was awesome. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, for our family members, for our friends, for our neighbors, for our coworkers. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Jesus actually said while he was ministering, people will know you're my disciples by the way that you love them. Not by the way that you say, not what's on your Facebook page, not what's on the back of your car as a bumper sticker, but by the way you show love to people in action. But if you don't believe me, maybe you'll trust Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, everyone can be great because anyone can serve. Every single person can be great because anyone can serve. When you do something, that's when your story goes from good to great. When you do something, when you put actions to your life, your story is gonna go from good to great. So talk to anyone who serves in hospitality, who serves in cafe, who serves as an usher, who serves in student ministries, they will tell you their purpose is fulfilled in how they serve God. Paul wrote this letter to one of uh, these young men that he was discipling, and that man was named Timothy. He must have been a teenager at this time, but he was going out preaching the gospel, praying for people, saving the lost. And this is what Paul tells Timothy. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners then others will realize that they too, they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God, amen. He alone is God, amen. This worst life that I've lived, these people that I've, I've gotten in trouble, these people I've killed, God took the worst of sinners and turned that life around, but not so that I could feel good, not so that I could just feel good again, not so that I could have grace, but so that every life I touch will know the glory of God. So that every life I touch will experience the grace and the forgiveness of God. God, church, I'm telling you right now, you've got a story. And you're trying to hide it. You're trying to shove it in a label. You're trying to put on this appearance of perfection, but nobody wants to follow a perfect leader. They want to follow someone who's real. They want to know that this life transformation that Jesus gave us is available to them. The last thing I think Rahab would have told us is this. God signs his name to your story thank him. Thank him. You know, we talk a lot about how God can bless us, how God can give us things and give us blessings, but did you know that you can actually bless God too? And you do that by your praise. You do that by thanking him. You do that by saying, God, I know this circumstance isn't resolved yet, but you promised me that you were going to work all things out for the good of those who love you, Lord. Thank you for redeeming me in this past situation, God. I thank you for that. I praise you for who you are, but I got some more praises I need to, to say. God, I'm gonna praise you in advance for the redemption that's coming my way. Everything that happens in life, man, all of those labels that are put on you, God takes those off and he says, my name is on your life. My life was paid for your life. So the only label that applies to you is a daughter and a son of the God in heaven a daughter and the son of your father, the king. The Bible says we are co-heirs with Christ. 
Everything Jesus inherits, we inherit too. Thank him this morning, church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are, Lord. Thank you for saving us, God. Thank you for providing a way, for giving us a path, Lord, for, for, for giving us a redemptive ending, for not stopping at part one, for, but for continuing into part two, Lord. Thank you. God, I lift up every circumstance to you, every prayer that's not yet answered. God, every uh, redemption that hasn't yet been seen, Lord, will we stand in faith, knowing that you work all things out for the good of those who love you. Lift up every marriage to you. I lift up every financial struggle to you, God. I lift up every uh, college, high school, uh, middle school, elementary school student to you, Father. Will we finish strong? Will we run the race with perseverance, Lord? Casting aside the chains, casting aside sin, and focusing on you. Now this is that moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, if while I was speaking, if you felt like God wanted to move on your life or, or you want to take that next step into trusting God with your life, you want to take that next step and say, Jesus, there's something to this Jesus. I don't know everything already. I'm not a theologian yet, but I want to know more. I want to follow God. I want to give my life to him. Is that something that you want? I want to give you that opportunity right now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm just going to ask you to, to repeat this prayer with me, either in your heart or out loud if you feel comfortable. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I know I mess up. I recognize that I am a sinner. Today I receive your forgiveness. Today I receive your grace. Make me new, Father. Today I trust you. Today I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning into today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.